All right, if you'll take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, you know, I was studying for a series that I wanted to start, and the more I was reading, we were going to go through a pamphlet, and uh, I really liked the pamphlet, but there are some things that I just wasn't sure about, so then I studied it more and more, and I just came to the conclusion that, like, it's probably best not to. So the message that I have tonight is really just something that's been on my mind for a little bit, um, and it's just five verses, but I really think they're powerful verses. A part of being in a question and answer ministry is that people tend to latch on to you for support. There is nothing greater that you can learn than to trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, To trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Those are very sweet and precious verses to me because a long time ago, in 2011, right before a a giant rainstorm came, I was sitting in a golf cart with Dr. Arnold, and he shared me those verses. And he told me that I can't know the will of God for my life if I don't know his word. And I'm so thankful that someone really took my head and pointed it right to the Bible and said, son, this is where you need to be. This is where you need to plant your seeds. This is where you need to get roots so that when you grow up in a spiritual maturity, people are going to be risen up and they're going to fall away. They're going to rise up. They're going to fall away. You think about the old FBC, one of the fastest growing Bible colleges in the country, eradicated because of one man's sin. I mean, there were people who said, I'm not going to go here anymore because I was here for this person. And of course, that's not right. But what ends up happening is people begin to latch on to things that are not going to be able to withstand the winds and the rains and the, the, the trials of your life. And if you're not careful, you can fall into that same trap. So with the question and answers ministry, you know, we get a lot of people sending in questions. And I'll tell you, it's overwhelming. There's about three or four questions coming in uh, a week right now. And I'm just doing the best I can to get out good information because some people are asking very broad questions like, what do you think about dispensationalism? It's like, well, I can give you a a, a two-sentence answer. We can go into a nice detailed article that we can post online, and I think that would be better. So you're preparing for that, and then someone sends you another question, and someone sends you another question, and that's good. That's what we want. But I want to make sure that we we look to the Scriptures in regards to where our hope lies. When I was on vacation, and I'm sitting out there, and I was just enjoying it, it was so much sweeter to be there and to be there with my wife and to have our nephews come in for one day and, and enjoy everything. It wasn't sweet because my phone was off. It wasn't sweet because we got a discounted rate. It wasn't sweet because I wasn't able to take phone calls and emails. It was sweet because I'm still serving the Lord. And I know that whatever I'm experiencing on that week is going to be nothing compared to eternity. And it makes, it makes serving so much easier when we're trusting in the Lord. But unfortunately, I, I'm seeing this with people that they're just getting caught up in a trap of their mind. There, there are questions that come in. And they plant seeds of doubt. I'm sure many of you have gone through this where something can just become so complicated in your mind that you're literally paralyzed by your body's emotions. Some people have panic attacks, uh, and that's exactly what those things are, where you feel like now all of a sudden you begin to focus on your breathing. And your breathing is fine, (laughs) but your brain is telling you that something is wrong. And you can put yourself into the need of medical care because of our minds going out of control. i give you something that happened to me weird on Saturday night. All of a sudden, I'm laying in bed, and I hear a ringing in my ear. And I know people in my life that have serious tinnitus, and it is something that plagues them. And right away, outside of my control, the thought that came into my mind was, this is going to be here forever. This is going to be something that you're going to deal with forever. Because if you read up on it, you know that it's something that people end up dealing with. And I know people that they've lost sleep over it, they've gotten special hearing aids for it because it's been such a distraction in their life. And I kid you not, because my mind went there, it got louder. Do you know what I'm talking about? You dwell on something long enough, your mind will trick your body into thinking that there is something seriously wrong. And 
I lost probably a good three and a half hours of sleep over that. And then the next day when I woke up, I couldn't help but my mind once again snapped to, hey, check and see if that ringing is there. And if it is, welcome to your new eternal life. <laughs> you know, like that's how my mind was working. And, you know, I don't even think about it now, but I guarantee you, if I were to think about it for a little bit, I'd hear it. And it would be something that would bother me. My point with that is, our mind is very, very deceptive. And there are things, if we're not careful, that we can believe about an individual or about a ministry that say things like, this person is my rock. They are the person that I'm going to go to. They're the ones that I need in my time of help. And that's, that's not true. Because they're a person just like you. The one we need to cling to is the rock, Jesus Christ. The foundation in which no man can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And when I was thinking about just everything that's going on with the question and answer ministry, I just wanted to make sure that people understood what is the purpose of our lives? What is the purpose of the things that we say and do? You can go on YouTube right now and you can find people that will spend hours explaining one word. And that's great to an extent. But every time I've seen that so far, they don't know how to explain the gospel to a regular person. They don't want to go to the drunkard. They don't want to go to the prostitute. They don't want to go to the person that's struggling with pornography. They don't want to go to the people that have real life problems and give them the good news that they need to hear. They want to talk to the educated. They want to talk to the intellectual. They want to appeal to the intelligent life forms, not the ones that we're not going to spend any time with. You know who spent time with people like that? Jesus Christ. And he was persecuted for it. It was brought against his testimony. As if it was something, why is this man eating with the, publican, with the publicans and the sinners? Why aren't you? Do they not need help? The simple in the world, what we would call the basic ones, sometimes people get so theologically deep that they make the lost man have to have, to have a degree in Bible knowledge before they can get saved. How much did the Philippian jailer know? He knew enough. <laughs> I don't know if he understood eternal sonship <laughs> or that Jesus Christ was the creator of the world. Are we going to make that a, a prerequisite before someone understands what is necessary for eternal life? If we're going to boil it down. It's this. You have a sin payment. You are condemned. Somebody took your place. Will you put your faith in him? That's it. That's what people need to know. And there's ways that we can get that laid across. But what ends up happening is as people begin to grow up into spiritual maturity, they latch on to people and individuals and channels and ministries, and they depend on those people to give them everything that they need. And a lot of those ministries, they fall right into that trap. They fall into the trap of, yeah, we're going to start with the gospel, we're going to go on to bigger and better things, and the soul-winning programs die, and no one's prepared, and the idea of reaching someone who's a lesser individual is just... No, we don't have time to reach them. we got to hit the intellectual people. We don't have this passage up here on the screen, but if you were to look, in, we're not going to look there now, but take note of Acts 17. When Paul is talking to uh, the people on Mars Hill, he goes into an extremely deep discussion in which these philosophers, these high thinkers, they were understanding what he was saying, but the last part of the verse says, some believed, some didn't. Not to say that wasn't effective, but by the time Paul got to Corinth and he began to teach things, he said something specifically about, this is the only thing I want to be known for. Look what it says there in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul's testimony was not a five-week event in which on the fifth week you found out what he believed. It was short, it was sweet, it was to the point, and verse 2 tells you what it was. For I am determined not to know anything, not one thing, among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, that doesn't mean the burial and resurrection are not important because his resurrection is important because he died. What did he do on the cross? He is the Messiah of the Jewish people. He is the Savior of the entire world. And that's all that Paul wanted to know when he was going into someplace. Listen, you, you are probably going to get a phone call in your life 
where you got to speak somewhere or you got to go somewhere and talk to somebody. Maybe there's a family member that is dying in the hospital. Maybe there's someone who suddenly passed away and it's your turn to come up there at the eulogy and say something. Are you going to be ready for those types of events? How about when everything around you falls apart? Because listen up, folks, it will. It will. Some of you have already experienced that. We've seen my, uh, a part of my family have a serious accident avoided. Dave just talked about one tonight. If you think you're, you're excluded from that, Hortense with an almost pretty serious fall yesterday landed on pillows and a quilt. Now that's because it's Hortense. You know, she knows how to do that kind of... This is the same lady who came to church with no breaks, people. I'll never forget that story, Hortense, and how you are still here. <laughs> but things are going to happen in our lives where we're going to have to say something on the spot. I remember a story in a book that I read or a testimony that I had heard of a man who witnessed a motorcycle accident, and the guy who was on the motorcycle was flayed out on the road. And he's dying. And the guy who saw the accident got out of the car, ran out to him, and the man on the motorcycle said, I need a priest. And that man who got out of the car and rushed to his aid says, I am a priest. And he's a born-again believer, and he led him to Christ right there. And as far as I know, that man on the motorcycle, he died. Do you think that the guy who got out of the car sat down cross-legged and said, let me tell you about soteriology, justification, three points of sanctification, and then we'll get you into a church so you can tithe 10% so we can really know that you're going. That's a man that was based on clarity and knew what needed to be said. It's a simple thing, and so we should be simple. Look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. This is Paul, okay? This is the, the one who God used to write a large portion of the New Testament. He was there with, quote, fear, weakness, much trembling? I don't think there's anything wrong with being afraid. I say that to the men, too. It's all right to be afraid. Here's where the issues come up. What are you going to let that do to you? How is that going to drive you? I'm working with a young man right now, and he knows who he is, and I'm, I'm praying with him, and he knows that. But he's struggling with his mind right now. He understands the gospel. He gets it right. But then he runs to YouTube and he runs to websites and they say things like, you got to be a Unitarian. You got to be a Trinitarian. <laughs> and he gets trapped all over again. And I'm telling him, stay in the Bible. You want to know the best way to grow, even for all of us here? Share your faith. Go out and share your faith. As you begin to share your faith, you'll win some people to Christ you get some people that'll ask you some pretty good questions, and you'll find out all the questions are fairly easy to answer. You go back, you get prepared, you go out, and the next time someone asks that kind of question, you're ready. This is how you grow. Producing other copies of yourself. Getting other people to understand the gospel like somebody reached you. Brother Ron tonight said he's only been witness to twice now, three times in his life. He's lived a lot of days outside of just three days. <laughs> but can you imagine how important the first day was? And that someone cared enough for the second day? And that a, there was a third day? I don't think Dr. Arnold's been witnessed to three times in his life. I have only been witnessed to once. Well, I say twice because I'm sure Dr. Arnold asked me. I just don't remember. But I've lived a lot of days outside of two. You know how wonderful it would be if we made a commitment to reach at least one person a day? What are we going to do with that opportunity, though? We've got to be simple, and we have to be clear. Verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of, and if you were here for our Corinthian study, you probably already have this marked. But if not, you can circle this where it says, man's wisdom, he's not talking with the intellectual background and knowledge because the gospel goes against that. You look at salvation according to just man's basic the uh, theology, it looks at the cross and says, that's it? 
Yeah, that's all that's ever needed because that's all that ever could be done. Not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. And here's where, my, here's where all the strings that are dangling out here right now get tied to one hook. Our salvation is not built upon what another man says, but about what the Word of God clearly teaches. And you will remain spiritually stunted in growth if you look to other people to justify what you believe. You will forever be stunted. And you're going to miss out. The addictions program is not a program just for people that are on hardcore drugs. It's not a program for people that are into only sexual sins. It's for you and for me. Here's what that program teaches. Replace your addiction with your relationship in Christ. Today, we all chose something else over that relationship at some point. You may be in habitual sin right now in which you are choosing daily to replace your walk with Christ with something of the flesh. Talking with the volunteers last night. Some of them have gone through some very specific things. Stephanie, she's gone through some very specific things. She's open about her testimony, what she was involved in. She'll be able to reach a certain type of person that comes in. But everybody else is kind of like, oh, you know, I, I quit this and I quit that, but there was nothing serious. If you have a flesh nature, this program is for you. <laughs> it's not just for the people that have a stronger addiction to their flesh. And the program is a 12-step program that is very reflective of what is needed. Deny the lust of the flesh. Walk in the light of the Spirit. And you learn how to do that, you'll become disciplined and you'll grow. Those of you who are faithful understand that. You're doing that. And it's not a program where we walk around like this, hands on hips, condemning, 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 polishing our own image, to say we're the ones that have arrived. A part of the program is at 9 p.m., the doors don't close. You realize that? They stay open. We're not just going to have finger food. We're going to have real food because we want people to stay and fellowship and talk because that's how people grow. They grow together as a community, stronger together. You've got to show that you care about people. And the best way you can do that is to have a message that's clear and easy to understand. When I was working at the bank and I was really beginning to grow in my Christian life, a flat tire was an opportunity. Because Lord knows I can't change a flat tire well. So when someone would see me struggling on the side of the road and they pull up trying to help, guess what they're getting? The gospel. It became more than just a shirt pocket. It was a track holder. There's just opportunities abound when you have a message that is easily repeated and it's simple and clear. Look at that verse at the last part. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The wisdom of man is powerless. The power of God is everything that we've got. When it talks about God's right hand, we're not talking about his physical right hand. We're talking about his power. When we say that God has feet and he walks is to show that he moves his eyes, not that he has actual physical eyes, but that he can see all things. God is invisible. In the Old Testament, when they saw God, they saw Jesus. And folks, one day we're going to walk into his embrace. I hope it's not just us. I hope that we don't get caught up and say, well, I don't know enough. If you know John 3.16, you know enough. But be careful of going into this I got to get into somebody else. I got to get into a pastor or a ministry, and, and they got to help me grow. You won't last long in regards to your effectiveness. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the whole, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You compare Bible with Bible. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So let me ask you a question as we're closing here. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. 
Why are we going to go trust another natural man with our spiritual growth? And I do not mean that like, well, I don't have to come to church because the Bible can teach me everything. Yeah, the Bible can teach you everything. It also clearly teaches you to not forsake the fellowship of one another. And I love how people think that verse is taken out of context. It's not. It's not taken out of context at all. We encourage one another by being around one another. But I want you to understand here, when, we, when, when it all boils down, when everything is said and done, can you be simple? If the moment were to strike and you had an audience for one minute, could you say the things that are necessary for them to understand and receive eternal life? That may be a once-in-a-lifetime moment, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Sometimes I see, you can close your Bible, sometimes I see with these parent-teacher conference, no, not the parent-teacher conferences, the school board meetings, people have a minute. And they have real grievances, and they have real concerns, but they have, they're not ready to say anything. They spend 50 minutes giving you a backstory, they got 10 seconds to load the weapon, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's nothing for them to say because they don't know what they want to say. And a lot of times, the people that are pretty accurate and clear, oh, the mic gets cut off because what you're saying is offensive. But let's not be like that. When we have an open mic and we got a chance to talk, maybe someone comes over for coffee. Maybe you talk to a neighbor. The neighbor reaches out to you. Something comes up and there's an opportunity. Are you going to be ready to be simple and clear? And then as my secondary point, don't just rely on a ministry to help you. Well, you're supposed to help me. And you know how you get help? Look in the Bible. That's my job. My job is to teach you the Bible and then point you to it. And I will walk alongside you, but I'm not going to be your faith. I don't want to be the object of your faith. What if something happens and I'm gone? Does, does, well, everything's just got to stop now. No, things need to continue. We have to be ready for that opportunity. And the more you submit yourself to the Word of God, guys, you're going to grow leaps and bounds. That's why we encourage people to go to college and stuff like that. Because it, it's like a catalyst. You're studying it every day. And there's people who have mapped out specific studies for you that you now apply, and you grow and you grow and you grow. We've had two students added as a result of Dr. Arnold's travels. And they're popping out quizzes left and right. I came back from vacation. I had a 68 uh, quiz results in my email. Everyone just decided, well, Jesse's off. Let's do all of our quizzes and tests. So when he comes back on Monday, he'll be ready to schedule his next vacation. And I did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I don't want this to be, I'm not yelling at you, nor am I upset with anybody. I just want you to see and understand the things that I've come to understand. There's sweet fellowship when you know the Word. You know the one who wrote it. Well, you've got to study the life of Christ to understand who Christ is. Study the Bible. He's the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among us. You know this, you know Jesus. This hand to represent you and me and my wallet to represent sin. I'll put this on top of my hand because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This hand will represent Jesus Christ. John 3.16 is illustrated this way. This is the path to eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our salvation is not anything of ourselves. We can't make any kind of satisfactory payment to get rid of this sin on our own. We've got to be perfect. We all miss the mark. Jesus took our place. He took that sin which so easily besets us. He laid it upon himself. He died, he was buried, and he rose again three days later. And the moment that a person puts their faith in that finished work of Jesus Christ, they are absent. Excuse me, they're not instantly dead. <laughs> they now are passed from death unto life. They'll never have to worry again about their eternal life. That's simple, that's clear, and that's the power of God as opposed to the wisdom of man. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Those of you who are in the audience, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, maybe you're watching online. If you've never understood the gospel, I want to invite you right now where you sit to put your faith in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for the full payment of your sin. The moment that you do, 
You're justified before God forever. You are no longer brought into condemnation and you have received eternal life. If you've done that today, would you please just send us an email or leave us an interaction on our website? We'd be more than happy to reach out to you. For those of you here in the audience, if that's your first time understanding that, you can also place your trust in Jesus. I know most of you here. I know all of you here, and I'm really thankful for that. I, I just want you to continue to be in your Bibles, continue to be simple and clear with the opportunities that you have. Father, thank you for this study. Bless the choir practice coming up next, and Lord, bring us all back here safely uh, for worship on Sunday morning. We pray for Freddie getting in tomorrow, for Trent and all the things he has to do to set up uh, the podcast and, and run ranch tomorrow, and, and for Freddie speaking in ranch, and pray for good weather for the coils so they can enjoy some of this wonderful Florida weather, and we just thank you, Lord, that we have fellowship together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.